Right now, there are 37 missing kids from Minnesota, according to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And Brandon Swanson disappeared outside of Marshall when he was 19 years old. And we're going to talk about one such case today, the case of Brandon Swanson. The disappearance of Brandon Swanson. This is a case that takes place in Minnesota, a few hours away from where I am uh, now living. And this is the case of Brandon Victor Swanson. Yeah, Coven, Brandon Swanson. Brandon Swanson. Brandon Swanson. Brandon Swanson. Brandon Swanson. What if somebody vanished out of thin air, never to be seen or heard from ever again? Born in Marshall, Brandon graduated from high school in 2007 at Marshall High School. He studied at Minnesota West Community and Technical College, a college of about a thousand students at the time, in order to study wind turbines. Just an ordinary teenager living an ordinary life. The end of the academic year for Minnesota West Community and Technical College, which meant the end of classes for the year. Brandon and his friends decided to go out to celebrate the special occasion. After an evening of celebration and moderate drinking, Brandon left a party located in Canby, the location of his college's campus. Shortly after midnight, Brandon left Canby to head back to his parents' house in Marshall, which was around a 30 to 40 minute drive. Brandon crashed into a ditch on his way home. After unsuccessfully trying to free his car and contact his friends, at 1.54 a.m., Brandon called his parents. He told his parents that he wasn't hurt and that there wasn't any damage done to the car, but he needed to be picked up and driven home. According to Brandon's parents, Brandon was absolutely sure he was near the city of Lind, only 10 minutes away from Marshall. His parents stayed on the phone with him as they drove towards his apparent location, but when they arrived at the location, Brandon and his car were nowhere to be seen. Brandon's parents flashed their truck's headlights repeatedly, and Brandon did the same with his car, but they were still unable to see each other. At around 2.17am, Brandon told his mother that it would be best if he were to walk to the town of Lind, as he noticed the town's lights, and to meet him at a well-known bar in Lind. His parents agreed, and his father, Brian, dropped his mother off at their house and drove towards the bar. Brandon and his father were on the phone together the entire time during a 47 minute long phone call, hoping that they would encounter each other while Brandon was walking to Lind. Brandon was walking along gravel roads away from Marshall and towards Lind, but at one point he decided to cut through a field, believing that it would be faster than just following the road. He noted that he encountered some fence lines and that there was some water rushing nearby. However, at the 47 minute mark of the call, Brandon yelled, Oh shit! The call went silent. Brandon's parents tried calling him numerous times, but they were unable to reach him. Brandon has not been heard from since. Brandon's parents turned to his friends for help. They searched roads and farmland, but they were unable to find any trace of him. At around 6.30 a.m., Brandon's mother reported Brandon's disappearance to the Lind Police Department. The police, however, were reluctant to investigate right away because Brandon had the, quote, right to be missing. They pointed out that it wasn't very unusual for young men around Brandon's age to be out all night. The police started the investigation later in the morning, after several hours had passed, only after they realized the severity of the situation. After doing a search in and outside of town, finding no traces of Brandon ever being there, the police contacted the Lyon County Sheriff's Office in order to better assist them in the search for Brandon. The sheriff was able to obtain Brandon's phone records. The records showed that Brandon was not actually near Lind at all. His phone calls were traced to a cell tower over 20 miles away from Lind. His vehicle was found in Porter, Minnesota, a town 25 miles away from Lind. The investigators brought search dogs to search the area where Brandon's vehicle was found. The dog's trace is sent towards the Yellow Medicine River, which was believed to be around 15 feet deep in some areas during the time of Brandon's disappearance. At the time, investigators believed that Brandon had fallen into the river, as one of the dogs briefly stepped into the river and stepped out, which the investigators believed was a sign that Brandon fell into the river. But Brandon's trail went beyond the river. The dogs were able to trace Brandon's scent to another gravel road, where they were unfortunately unable to follow the trail further. The search for Brandon was conducted based on the notion that Brandon had fallen into the river and drowned, but the investigators were unable to find his body or any trace of him at all, which they should have been able to do had he fallen into the river and drowned. I can't explain why clothing, belongings wouldn't surface. I can't explain why after searching for three weeks, the dogs could not smell anything. All of this begs the question, what really happened to Brandon Swanson that night? One of the more popular theories regarding Brandon Swanson's disappearance is that Brandon lost his footing near the Yellow Medicine River, fell in, and drowned. The moment where the call went silent and Brandon yelled, Oh shit! could have very well been him falling into the river. 
After all, Brandon did note the sound of rushing water earlier in his journey, and his father did hear Brandon's foot slipping before the call went silent. One of the main issues with this theory is that there are no remains or belongings found of Brandon's in or near the river at all. If Brandon did fall in the river, some trace of him physically would have been left behind. There is also one more issue with this theory. Did you catch my phrasing earlier? The call went silent. I said that the call went silent. Most sources will tell you that the call was immediately ended, but I found a post made by Reddit user Beth Ramon that linked me to a Nancy Grace segment where Brandon's mother states, Oh, yes, we did. You know, we we didn't immediately hang up the phone. We, you know, we called his name. We tried to, you know, thinking that he still had the phone, that it was very near him, that he could pick it up. We'd he'd hear our voice, and we, we called out to him several times, and we realized, you know, he's, he's not there. Taking this into consideration, Brandon's parents surely would have heard rushing water when Brandon lost his phone, or even shortly before. I mean, Brandon's father even heard Brandon's foot slipping. However, I've never been in a situation similar to this at all, and it's small evidence, but I believe when you put this together with the fact that there is no physical evidence found in or around the river, it makes the falling and drowning theory very unlikely, though it does not disprove the fact that Brandon might have slipped and fell into the river momentarily. This brings me to one theories. It's important to note that Brandon must have been disoriented, maybe even intoxicated during the night. He had just attended two different parties and was drinking alcohol at one or both. Though one eyewitness stated that Brandon was not overly intoxicated, it is safe to assume that at the very least, Brandon was very disoriented, given the fact that he had no sense of direction and where he was located. Something else that very well could have contributed to his lack of sense of direction was the fact that he did not take Highway 68, which was a direct route from Canby to Marshall which could have been to avoid the police in a DUI charge, as mentioned by Jeff Hasse. Considering his disorientation, it is very possible that Brandon, while traveling along the bank of the Yellow Medicine River, lost his footing and fell into the river, but got out somehow. The temperature got to as low as 37 degrees Fahrenheit that night, meaning it would have been very possible for a person of Brandon's size, around 5 foot 6 and 120 pounds, to get hypothermia. Hypothermia would have only added to the disorientation that Brandon was experiencing. Eventually, Brandon would have died to the hypothermia while trying to find his way back home. The first theory comes from Reddit user KarmaFrog1, and I thought it was very interesting. Brandon was in an area full of cultivated farmland with a sparsely populated population. After either dying or maybe even falling asleep for a little while, it would not be too far-fetched to think that Brandon could have been run over by some farm machinery. Farmers in that area have been reluctant to share info with law enforcement in the past. There are also many undocumented immigrants that work in agriculture. Some articles even say that over 50% of farmhands are undocumented. This would make it even more unlikely that those in the area would even consider reporting a dead body to local law enforcement. A very specific theory sure, but one that could very well be true. I do want to preface these next theories with the fact that foul play is very unlikely. Given how sparsely populated the area Brandon was in was, it's almost impossible that he could have been encountered by someone randomly, or even by someone he knew deliberately, much less tracked for hours in the dark in the middle of a field. But what if Brandon Swanson had an outstanding drug debt? According to the Nancy Grace segment, there's a pipe found in Brandon's car. It's unclear what kind of pipe it was, but maybe it could have indicated that Brandon was using drugs like meth or something to that extent at the time. There are some who claim to have heard rumors about Brandon having a drug debt at the time, and was in fact killed for it, but there seems to be not much more evidence to that other than the rumors. To me, this seems extremely unlikely. Surely Brandon would have mentioned seeing someone before the phone call with his father went silent, and his father might have been able to hear someone other than Brandon through the phone had this occurred. I doubt that drug dealers were stalking Brandon for miles through the middle of a field over what could not have been more than a few hundred dollars in drug debt. It's even more unlikely that he would have encountered one of his dealers randomly if he in fact had a drug debt. Not too much basis in this theory. The more likely of the foul play theories, at least in my opinion, is the theory that Brandon met a disgruntled farmer and was killed for trespassing. Farmers in the area have been uncooperative in this investigation and many others, many refusing to let investigators search their property. Many landowners do keep a close eye on their property and may not be too keen about a disoriented teenager trespassing on their property. Again, there isn't too much physical evidence of this occurring and unfortunately is entirely speculation, but I still find this theory more likely to have occurred than the drug debt theory. Unfortunately, we may never know what happened to Brandon Swanson on the date of May 14th, 2008. Each day, month, and year that passes means it's increasingly unlikely that Brandon or his body will ever be recovered. Whether Brandon drowned in the river, died of hypothermia, or was the victim of a murder, we may never know for sure what happened that night, and unfortunately, this case remains unsolved. 
I do want to take a moment to tell you about one good thing that came out of this case, which was Brandon's law. This law essentially states that law enforcement must take a missing persons report without delay and conduct a preliminary investigation into whether or not the person is missing and whether they are in immediate danger. It also requires law enforcement to notify all law enforcement agencies of the situation. Brandon's parents played a big part in getting this law passed and thanks to them, more people may be saved in the future. Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed, please like, subscribe to the channel, and share this video with your friends. It really does mean a lot to me. Also, make sure to comment any video suggestions you have. Um, and that's all I have to say, so I'll see you guys in the next video.